Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central and it's time for another episode of Guns N' Roses True Story. So I had done a couple of ones before about Izzy Stradlin. I did one about his return to Guns N' Roses in 1993 uh, where he filled in for Gilby Clark after he broke his wrist in a motorcycling accident. So uh, Izzy came back for five shows that Guns did across Israel, Greece, Turkey and two shows in the UK. And this episode, I want to talk about something that maybe a lot of Guns N' Roses fans don't know. So for a short period of time in 1995, uh, Izzy actually came back to Guns N' Roses and started to write some songs with them. At least he started to write some songs with Duff while Slash was away touring with Snake Pit. And before we get started talking about those years in 1995, let's talk about how things ended with Izzy. So in 1993, Gilby breaks his wrist and here's the report on MTV News. And the Guns N' Roses guitarist who left that group in 1991 amid much recrimination is back on stage with the band, at least temporarily, pinch hitting for the guitarist who replaced him, Gilby Clark. Clark recently broke his fretting wrist in a motorcycle accident, so Guns frontman Raxel Rose put in a fence bending call to Stradlin, who has a band of his own called the Juju Hounds, and persuaded him to rejoin for a few weeks to play some overseas dates. Meanwhile, three other. So, following those dates that Izzy did with the band, things seem to end on a sour note. Izzy came back, according to Slash's book, just to check out how things were going. And it seemed like to Izzy, a lot of things hadn't really changed. So he basically took off without really even saying goodbye to everybody in the band. And apparently one of the conditions for him to come back and fill in for Gilby was that he was owed a bunch of money. And it was somewhere on the, uh, around a million dollars, according to the reports I've read. And he said, I'm not going to come back and fill in and help you guys out unless you pay me the money I'm owed. So Guns N' Roses, it sounds like reluctantly agreed to do so. And then Izzy came back. And the f dates following Izzy's departure in 1993, pretty much every show of the European t tour uh, for the remaining leg of that tour, Izzy, uh, Double Talk and Jive was dedicated to Izzy by Axel. If you watch any of those shows <clears throat> from uh, late May to er early July, uh, you can see that Axel's still very upset at Izzy. So there was even an interview that Slash did after the Use Your Illusion tour ended. You know, once the tour ended, Guns started to focus their attention on the spaghetti incident, and they started to promote the album and do interviews. So Slash did an interview back in 1993 where he talked about the spaghetti incident and actually playing with Izzy. So here's what Slash had to say. He said, I loved recording like this, uh, referring to the spaghetti incident. He said, during Appetite, Lies, and Use Your Illusion, I had to put up with Izzy the whole time. I never liked playing with him. It was wonderful to escape him on this record. It sounds tighter and so much cooler than anything we've done before. I always got irritated over Izzy's way of playing. It didn't sound right. Before Spaghetti, we erased his guitar and Gilby put a new one on. It sounded perfect. And those negative feelings towards Izzy didn't really change uh, even into the new year. So Axel and Slash were on Rockline in 1994 in January promoting the Spaghetti incident and a caller called in asking whether they had any plans to record with Izzy. Here's what they had to say to that question. Coming up next week, Big Head Todd and the Monsters and Cracker next Monday night exclusively on Interactive Radio Rockline. Steve Downs here in our Los Angeles uh, Hollywood studios with Axl Rose and Slash from Guns N' Roses. And we're going to go uh, to uh, the Rocky Mountain State, as a matter of fact. Colorado Springs is where we're headed. Who wrote that Rockline riff? Uh, yeah. Who did write that? I forget who wrote that. Um, Dana Strum from, from, I'm sorry, from Slaughter wrote that riff uh, many, many years ago. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Just <laughs> wondered. <laughs> that says it all. Yeah, uh, Colorado Springs is where we're headed. Where was I? Kilo, that's where I was. Nick, you're on with Kilo. <laughs> How appropriate. <laughs> Nick, you're on, buddy. Kilo, Colorado? Hey, how's it going, guys? No way. Kilo, Colorado. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> What's happening? What's your question, Nick? Yeah, I was wondering, since uh, Duff did his solo album and Slash, you worked on that Jimmy Tribute album, is anyone else going to do any solos or work on any other albums? Um... I tell you the truth, Duff's solo album, uh, Gilby's doing one. It's pretty much finished. Uh, that's basically it. I don't have any plans to do one. I don't, know, I don't think I have. Yeah, I'm, you do I'm, have hoping to, I'm trying to put a project together that uh, is kind of a top secret weapon right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll look forward to that. Gilby Clark, of course, uh, the uh, the uh, second guitarist for Guns N' Roses. Uh, thank you, Nick, for the call. Jeff is in St. Louis listening to KC95. Jeff, you're on Rockline. Hey, Axel, Flash, what's up? Hey, hey man. First off, I'd like to say the show in St. Louis that you did, the last show, was the best show I've ever been to. And my question is, wow. I, I've uh, heard some rumors that when Where were you when we you, that maybe Izzy would be brought back in uh, to help record things. Is there any truth to that? None, none no. at all. <laughs> Especially no, not to never again. Stuff. No. 
No, uh, not not at all. We uh, we brought Izzy back in Europe when Gilby had hurt his arm, and uh, then we kind of got blackmailed, and we haven't. Uh, we really don't want anything to do with Izzy ever since really? then. Wow. Yeah, in all in all in all honesty, it was cool to get him back. When you know when the idea came, and it was cool when he we, went away. <laughs> we thought it was a good idea to you know call him up and see if he wanted to come down and hang out and do a couple of gigs, and then it turned sour at the end. So we took us right back to square one. So. It was nice while it lasted. Yeah, nice to be back in St. Louis again. By the way, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've been. I was back there recently. That's right. For, and actually, it was. It wasn't bad. It was. It worked out real nice. Cool. And uh, there was a whole different vibe about things Great. once people got a different side of the story. Yeah, I want to go play there. <laughs> Jeff, Je- Jeff, thanks for the call. My- Fast forward now to the middle of 1994. Duff McKagan has a huge health scare. His pancreas explodes, and he's rushed to the emergency room. And that's really the moment for him where he becomes sober. So after he gets out of the hospital, he stops doing drugs, he stops drinking, and he starts to change his life around. And in an interview he did in the year 2000, he revealed that as soon as he had his health scare, uh, Izzy actually phoned him up too. So he said, uh, Izzy phone two, we've always been friends and our friendship has gone beyond music. We've been through a lot of things together. I play in his records, which usually takes no more than two days. It's like, here's a song, play, thank you. For the last record, he wanted to go away and play some shows with me. We were rehearsing in Hollywood for a week and we wanted to play some more shows, which were really fun. It was so easy. In Japan, everybody was around us, freaked. Seeing the two of us together, it was exciting. So 1994, Izzy Stradlin and the Juju Hounds were supposed to be recording their next album. And mysteriously enough, Izzy just ghosted his bandmates. So according to an article that Art Tavana did for the LA Weekly, 1994, Izzy mysteriously ghosted his bandmates and took a one-way trip to Europe. Some say he went to Spain. Others say it was to Sweden with his then-girlfriend. The Juju Hounds were recording in Tobago when it happened, an island in the Caribbean. He just took a turn, says Quintana, who was his drummer then. He didn't say where he was going, but he likes to travel, and I respect that. Nobody knows for sure why Izzy disappeared from those recording sessions, including Ashurst, whose life began to spiral out of control. He felt rudderless without the Juju Hounds. When the band broke up, I decided to get a heroin addiction, then kick it, just to be able to relate to Izzy better. Fast forward to 1995, Guns N' Roses are taking a break, so Slash can release his album, uh, Slash a Snake Pit, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. So this album comes out in February of 1995, and Slash goes on tour until August of that year. However, at the same time, uh, there's still work going on in the Guns camp. Duff is still around. Uh, Matt Sorum decides not to go touring with Slash a Snake Pit because Axel doesn't want him to go. And if he does go, there could be financial implications, meaning that Matt could have been fired. So... In April of 1995, Izzy steps back into Guns N' Roses for a short period of time. Around the same time, Guns N' Roses had their own record label called Uzi Suicide. So Uzi Suicide was looking at releasing some records. So there was four bands they were looking at, one of which was called The Assassins. That band featured Axel's half-brother Stuart Bailey as a guitarist and songwriter, and their music was described as a hot southern rock vein being currently pursued by the likes of Pride and Glory, and on the softer side, Blind Melon, and he maybe even Slash a Snake Pit. So with Juju Hounds folding, Izzy has a lot of time on his hands. So on March 10th, 1995, he joins Duff and Matt Sorum on stage in Las Vegas. So they were playing a gig with an all-star lineup to celebrate the opening of the joint. Little would the members of Guns N' Roses know that the next official Guns N' Roses show would actually be performed at the joint almost five years later. So years later, Izzy would do an interview in 2001 with a French media outlet in which he retold the story of how he joined Guns in 1995. So he said, in April 1995, Duff calls me again. I'm trying to compose new songs for the guys in GNR. Come and give me a hand. It made five years that I'd left Guns, but I said to myself, well, shit, after all, why not? Duff and I wrote 10 songs in the space of a week. We even recorded them as demos. And then Slash would say in an interview around the same time that there was a lot of debate going on in the Guns camp over who was going to play rhythm guitar. So in an interview he did with the New York Times on April 20th, 1995, Slash said, uh, Axel and I were having an argument about it yesterday. So the argument could have been related to Izzy's sudden return to the Guns camp and his possible re-entering to the band. And in the same, in a similar interview, uh, months later that Slash did, he said, Izzy's been writing, he wrote some stuff with Duff, he wants to write songs, but he doesn't want to deal with the whole thing. He's so laid back, he doesn't want to deal with any pressure. Izzy's Izzy. And then later on in the year, in a Brazilian magazine that uh, Slash did an interview, and he said, Izzy agrees with writing stuff, but he's not interested in touring, he doesn't want to deal with Axel. Now, it's not entirely clear why Izzy decided to not return to Guns N' Roses and why he basically came for a month and then went away and left. 
although he did tell a story in 2001 with Classic Rock that he talked about the last time he actually talked to Axel during the 90s. So he said in 1995, he was uh, in L.A. and he went to Axel's place and rang his doorbell. And basically Axel opened the door and he said, and I go up and he's like, hey, man, glad to see you. Axel gave him a big hug and showed him around his house. He said it was great. And then he said months later, uh, one night Axel calls me and we got into the issue of me leaving Guns N' Roses. I told him how it was on my side, told him exactly how I felt and why I left. But I mean, he had an effing notepad. I could hear him turning the pages going, well, uh, in 1982, you said this and so forth. He was bringing up a lot of really weird old shit. I'm like, whatever, man. But that's the last time I talked to him. So at the very end of April in 1995, Izzy actually appeared on stage with Slash's Snake Pit in the Metro in Chicago. He performed the last song of the set, which was a song called Bitch, which was actually a Rolling Stones cover. So here's footage of them introducing Izzy on stage. this episode of Guns N' Roses True Story. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comment section. What do you think Guns N' Roses album could have sound like, sounded like in 1995 had Izzy stayed in the band and they released an album in due time? Let me know in the comment section. Hit the like button, guys, if you enjoyed this episode. And be sure to subscribe if you like that video and you want to see more stuff just like that and you love Guns N' Roses. Also, you guys can go support me on Patreon and you guys can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date on the latest Guns N' Roses news and just to see some cool photos maybe you guys haven't seen about the band as well. Take care.